Yeah, it's a pain. If you guys haven't used it, just trust me. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. We're going to talk about the U carryouts today. Uh, in case you guys don't remember, little reminder, U carryout is the true nucleus, right? U true karyo nucleus. So these are the guys you could say potentially they have the more advanced cells. Uh, true nucleus, they're going to have all compartmentalized areas in their cells. We call those compartmentalized specialized areas organelles. And um, we'll move this out of the way. So it's not me. All right, organelles, just like we have organs in our body that do specific things for us, um, like the pancreas making uh, you know, enzymes to digest things, that we have organelles, including ones that hold enzymes to digest things, believe it or not, it's called uh, lysosomes. But so it's very analogous to that. And I like kind of like that. I like the compartments because you can name the areas and the function specific things. It's not just this vague concept that, yeah, it happens in the cytoplasm. That is like how it is with the bacteria. It's either in the cytoplasm or along the membrane, and it's kind of a vague concept. So um, obviously, we are eukaryotes. We have a true nucleus. We have mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum and all these organelles we're going to get into today. So uh, it's kind of useful to know that as far as your own physiology on the microscopic level. So um, the endosymbiotic theory. The idea is, and we're going to get into it quite, it's going to get brought up a lot in this chapter as we go through it, but it's the idea that like your mitochondria or other organelles in your body, in your cells, excuse me, would uh, have come from other organisms. So like if a precursor cell came and ate up another cell and then they became symbiotic and they were getting benefits from one another and it just stayed that way. That's the concept of how they think that organelles came to be. Now, I don't know what to tell you about an endoplasmic reticulum for this. They have their whole theory on that. I don't know much about it, but I will tell you about mitochondria. And it's going to come up over and over and over again. So don't worry, I'm definitely going to beat it into you. But mitochondria, as well as chloroplasts, they have their own genome. They divide separately from your cells. They have their own divisions. They divide by binary fission, like bacteria, not like our cells do with mitosis. Um, they have their genome is one circular DNA, just like bacteria, and their ribosomes are the exact same as bacteria, not like ours. Isn't that interesting? I feel like that is really compelling evidence to suggest that that is the case. And very interesting how that organisms can become so dependent on one another that they become a you know, part of one another. Now we don't even think of them as being separate anymore, right? Um, you already probably know that your mitochondria has a different DNA than the rest of your body probably know that because they talk about like your uh, mitochondrial DNA. That's a thing, right? And that, that comes from your mother. Why does it come from your mother? Because the sperm is too tiny to carry mitochondria. That's why. So that's where your mitochondria come from. Um, they're using energy that they have in that cell to swim and then they're doing all the work. So they don't uh, have the mitochondria. They can't carry all that crap with them. Um, but yeah. Cool. Okay. And they have two layer membranes too. Like um, gram negatives do whatever. Okay, we're gonna get into the eukaryotes, and these are the groups of the eukaryotes. I hate that this is hanging down. I just wish this would go away, but it is. There it goes. Um, ones that are unicellular, one that can be unicellular or multicellular, and the ones that are always multicellular. Now, if we put, we say helminths here, but that could be any animals really. Animals are gonna be multicellular, <laughs> right? So they're not just gonna be one um, cell. Now it does say helminths can have a unicellular egg and they may have unicellular larval forms as well, but that's not always the case. It just depends on the species we're talking about. But the adults that actually reproduce, those guys are always multicellular. We get into that, those are worms that we're getting into. Okay, so the parasitic worms. Um, so the always unicellular, those are the protozoa. That's gonna be things like malaria and giardia, and then we have the maybe unicellular or multicellular, we have fungi and algae. Obviously algae don't really associate that much with disease. Um, you have red tides, but it's not really so much that that algae is causing disease so much as they're producing toxins that are toxic, but they're not causing disease in you. Fungi can, we know this, this is like, um, I always forget why I'm trying to say it, a ringworm, an athlete's foot, those are obvious ones. All right. Cradle cap, I think, is one of them, too, but it just depends on how they got it. But anyways, all eukaryotic cells. So you remember how when we talked about the bacteria, we're like, all bacteria have 
like a cytoplasmic membrane and cytoplasm. And I was like, it really? <laughs> so here's what all the eukaryotes have. They're getting pretty uh, creative here. So all of them have this stuff. The, and we're going to talk about what each one is. No worries. Cytoplasmic membrane, just like the bacteria, it's just what holds the cytoplasm and all its contents. That's all that is. Nothing crazy. It says what it is in the name. The nucleus, we already know what that is, contains the genetic information. Uh, the mitochondria, that's going to be the energy powerhouse. The endoplasmic reticulum, we'll get there, I promise. Uh, the Golgi apparatus, we'll get there. It's not still not going to make sense to you. That's okay. <laughs> Vacuoles um, for storage. Cytoskeleton for structure as well as transport. And then the glycocalyx, that should be a familiar word to you guys. We talked about in the last chapter with the capsules and the slime layers. So um, same kind of deal here, but we're going to talk about what that is about for eukaryotes. Some eukaryotes might have a cell wall. Um, you may or may not know that plants have a cell wall made of cellulose. When we talk about needing more fiber in your diet, a lot of the time when we're talking about psyllium husk fiber, like you would get from Metamucil or whatever, it's because it's high in cellulose. You can't break down the fiber. Bacteria in your gut can, but it also helps to bulk up your stool, but make it softer and not quite so hard and that. So it's supposed to be good for you, whatever, but that's what fiber is about. It's cellulose, basically. We can't break it down properly on our own. Um, that's plants and some fungi have that too, some. Obviously, we don't have plants that are pathogens, so we're really not talking about them. The other kind of cell wall, I think it's the only these two, but I might be wrong. I know the other one is chitin. Chitin is the other rest of the fungi. The ones that don't have cell cellulose for their cell walls, they'll have chitin. Okay? Um, locomotor appendages just like the flagella that we were talking about before, but eukaryotes can have more, <laughs> different kinds, not just flagella. Um, and then we have chloroplasts. And I'm not sure you guys know that those are for um, photosynthesis. Yeah, they have chlorophyll, the green pigment that reacts with the sun and it makes energy for the plant. It is so cool. And I was writing, <laughs> I was writing unit two study a sheet for you guys. And I was going through, my, the metabolism chapter is my favorite chapter. So, I was going through that and I got to the photosynthesis part. I'm always reminded by how cool it is, really. Like when you look back on how plants, like we talk all the time about how plants um, use the carbon dioxide up from our environment. And then basically, if you will, exhale oxygen. So we have oxygen in the air. That's a product of photosynthesis. But did you know that they also do aerobic respiration or cellular respiration, just like our cells do? So they need oxygen too. So it's also why you can't just have a, plant in just an, a carbon dioxide room, they won't survive. Even if you give them light and carbon dioxide, they have to have an oxygen source too, because um, they still do the same crap that we do. That's how they make most of their energy. It's just they started out using energy from the sun. I think it's pretty cool, but we'll get into that when we get into that. So that's what the chloroplast is for. It's for that, prepping them to get into making their own energy. Um, like I said, they have their own DNA chloroplasts to do and everything like we talked about with the mitochondria. So it's pretty compelling evidence that they used to be other organisms at some point. What else do I want to say about chloroplasts? Um, chloroplasts, we'll see these in plants and algae. Um, not fungi, okay? I just want to be aware, make you guys aware of that. People get confused about it because, you know, you think of fungi being a lot like plants but they're, they don't have chloroplasts. That's one thing that makes them quite different from plants. All right. Um, Cause yeah, people think of mushrooms. I want you guys to think more of like the furry mold more than, or like yeast um, than mushrooms. So this is our chart that is way less descriptive than the bacterial one, but at least shows you the structures. Um, you know, one good thing you could do is maybe go in, and fill in the information yourself if you wanted to while you're studying, but whatever, do what you need to do. So locomotor appendages, eukaryotic cells can have flagella, just like bacteria. They are 10 times thicker than the bacterial ones. They are more complex structurally. They are have like a membrane, like they're an extension from the membrane. Like the whole cell is just, the membrane is just one. Whereas the bacteria had this motor and like the protein based spinny thing sticking out of it. Um, so it's a cylinder. We have all these microtubules running through it. It's nine pairs 
and then two in the middle that give it structure. It can move in a whipping like motion in order to move. So they can control their direction way more effectively than the bacteria can because they're not relying on runs and tumbles. You'll see what I mean too. When we look at the pond water and you guys get to see all the organisms that are in pond water, it's actually one of the coolest ones, um, experiments that we do in there because you just sit there and look at it. It's not really anything else to do, but they swim around and you'll see all these different creatures that you never knew was in pond water. And I usually pull it from the pond that's just right outside of the administration building. So um, it's a fun one, but we'll get to do that soon. Um, but yeah, so this is just a picture of those microtubules. That's what these little circles are. So the pairs, nine pairs, and then two right in the middle. All right, cilia. We said bacteria do not have cilia. Cilia are like little furry extensions that eukaryotic cells are gonna use for typically feeding, but they can use it for locomotion as well. Usually gonna be feeding though. Um, so they sort of filter the area next to them and help move circulate water or whatever around them, it's usually water, in order to get new food into their environment. Um, so yeah, they row, use a rowing like motion to move stuff around them. All right, moving on to the glycocalyx. So those are the two structures associated with locomotion, the flagella and the cilia. So we already know you can move by either flagella or cilia, but we're gonna get to another way that they can move around as well. If you guys have ever thought of amoebas, you guys know amoebas, yeah? And they're all like lobed and they're little lobes that are on them and they can stretch them out and like pull themselves. Well, they're called pseudopods, so pseudo fake and pod like like podiatry, like feet, okay? So fake feet. And so I use a little fake feet to like reach out and stick to something and then pull on. They can also use them to feed, um, but that's what amoebas do. So that's called amoeboid movement, go figure. But they use pseudopods for that. So those are three ways that um, they can move if they move. Um, and of course, some of them don't. We know our cells don't. <laughs> and there's even some pathogens that don't. Um, so the glycocalyx for a eukaryotic cell, uh, if we are multicellular, typically we're talking about an extracellular matrix. So this is the things that help keep your cells together as your tissues. So the tissues that might make up the different parts of your organs and that, these are all kept held together by the extracellular matrix. That's our glycocalyx. Um, so it's sticky for us too, it's just we're using it differently. So instead of biofilms onto something, it's kind of like biofilms to each other, yeah? So still polysaccharides, and um, they can look like a network of fibers, or they could, just like in bacteria, look like a slime layer or a capsule, if we're talking about especially unicellular organisms. Okay, cell walls. Fungi and algae have the cell walls. We already talked about, um, and plants. Okay, so I forgot about the algae when I was talking about cell walls earlier. That's the one that I always forget. I always sit there, I'm like, I know I'm forgetting one. Algae. Um, algae, I feel like should be kind of a little bit because they do have the photosynthesis. If it's going to have photosynthesis um, and it's a eukaryote, it's going to have cell wall. Well, even if it's a prokaryote, right, or akaryote, bacteria have their own kinds of cell walls, right? So if it does photosynthesis, cell wall. Just think of it that way. Um, and then also fungi have cell walls, so they don't do photosynthesis. So they're different. That's how we put them aside. Um, algae are going to be more like plants. When we talk about algae too, which we're going to get into the individual groups in a moment, but um, that we're not just talking about the film on the top of like, uh, pond, ponds or lakes or whatever. We're also talking about like kelp and sea kelp and stuff like that. They look like plants to you, but they are actually algae. So that's another way you can just remind yourself that I feel like they fall into the plant category. They aren't plants, but <sighs> anyways, they don't cause disease. So at least I'm not going to ask about them a lot. <laughs> um, they do provide most of the oxygen in our environment, the algae. Those are those unicellular um, microbes that make most of our atmosphere is going to fall into that. But Okay, so our cell wall obviously is gonna give structure. That's the idea of this. It gives shape and structure, chitin or cellulose. For <coughs> plants and algae, it's gonna be cellulose. Um, the cytoplasmic membrane, the membrane lipid bilayer that holds everything inside of the cell. Um, it's always gonna be inside of the cell wall. So it's always gonna be literally touching the cytoplasmic membrane. It's like number one, cytoplasmic membrane. Number two, cell wall, if you have one. Number three, outer membrane, if you have one, whether you're bacteria or eukaryotes, right? All right, so um, cytoplasmic membranes for the eukaryotes, we have to stabilize them, especially if you don't have a cell wall. So we use sterols for that. And our most famous sterol that we probably know about in our system is cholesterol sterol. 
cholesterol, right? Um, that's the one that stabilizes our cells in our lipid bilayers. Um, that's why you need cholesterol. Um, if you're getting excess and it's not being used up properly, then it will, because it is a lipid, just stick together in your blood vessels and stick to the walls of the blood vessels and get stuck in there and create plaques. We already know that it can create really pretty significant issues with you know, the cardio system, right? Have to get it like cleaned out with balloons and all that. Um, we'll put stents in. All right, so sterols, that's gonna stabilize the membranes. And then they are selectively permeable, just like bacteria. We can only let certain things in and out. So we often have channels to allow for very other specific things to get in and out that we need to that wouldn't be able to go otherwise. All right, and the nucleus, this is our control center, as I like to refer to it. So it's the area where we're keeping all our genetic information. This is the Smithsonian, right? You're not gonna take anything out of the Smithsonian ever. So it's always gonna be staying there. So the original copies, for everything, the nucleus, the genetic material, it stays there. So if you need to make protein and your cell needs a certain protein made, then your RNA will be making a copy that you can then take out to make the protein. So you're not gonna take the DNA out. Okay, so inside, because of all this always happening and all of your genes either code for RNA that are gonna be involved in building protein or they're going to be encoding for the protein itself or they can be regulatory genes. They don't code really for a substance, but help regulate it, right? Most of your genes, as I'm sure you can tell by me saying all this, are gonna code for protein. So, and that's it, man. There's nothing else that your genes are coding for. They're not coding for some other special thing. If they're coding for, like we wanna make lipid, some lipid-based structure in your body, then we will make enzymes that make that lipid-based structure. So enzymes are proteins. So that's where everything is coming from, proteins. Um, you have about 20,000 genes in your body. Most of those are going to code for proteins. And you have the ability to make 8.5 billion different antibodies. Each one's a different protein. Isn't that cool? That like your body can work around that. I don't even think it's super neat. But um, proteins all relies on that. So your main uh, Smithsonian copy, your main book, your main DNA is going to be kept in the nucleus where it's nice and safe and contained. And we can work with it there. Um, so we have this area of the nucleus called the nucleolus because we're always making so much friggin' protein. You're also making the RNA that goes along with it. So the ribosomal RNA, that's what makes up ribosomes. That's what's going on in the nucleolus. So you can stain it. It looks different than the rest of the cell because we have such a concentration of specifically ribosomal RNA there. So we can make ribosomes to make you your protein constantly. All right. This is great. I love mitosis and meiosis. This is my least favorite thing when I took cell and molecular biology in graduate school. When I went to graduate school, I came from Oklahoma State University. I had my bachelor's degree. And yeah, I mean, I thought I was so fancy. I thought I was something else. Bachelor's degree um, in uh, biochemistry, magna cum laude. I had a minor in chemistry. I almost got a double major in microbiology, but I, they wanted me to stay another semester. And I was just like, screw this. Like I already had 149 hours. So it's just like, yeah, no, like I've done four years, I've got all these hours, like I'm, forget it, right? So anyways, I go on to this school and it's the University of Pennsylvania and it's an Ivy League school. And you know, I'm thinking I'm all fancy and all this because I'm like, oh yeah, I've got my body. Everybody there went to like Columbia and Dartmouth and Yale. And like, I'm just like, why am I here? Um, I'll tell you what though, like I thought I knew how to study that place taught me how to study. I had to really like buckle down and learn how to learn. Um, Cause I was skating by at OSU. Like I was doing fine, but I just didn't know that I wasn't doing the best I could do. Um, you know, man cum laude means I got at least a 3.8 GPA. So I did great. I didn't really need to work on the studying. I had, I had professors, I, like I took uh, philosophy and that philosophy professor got in an argument with me about something that I thought was my opinion and he didn't agree with it. And a lot of philosophy is based on opinion, by the way. Um, and yeah, he didn't like it. And so he gave me a B basically because like, it was a lot of like just subjective grading in that class. So he never, he never liked me. So I was mad about that. So stuff like that, I was blamed stuff like that for not having a floor plan. That was probably my fault. Um, but yeah, you get to a, a school like that and I just didn't know how to study. This was one of the things my first classes that I ever took when I got there was cell and molecular biology. It's what it sounds like. Everything you could ever possibly want to know about a cell and the molecular aspect down to every single molecule and chemical in everything that is happening in one semester. 
So that's how I learned about this stuff like properly. And I still don't remember it now, but at the time I learned it and it, I hate it. Like <laughs> this, is, this is what part of it, I just hate it. And I'm gonna go over it and make it real basic for you guys, okay? So the only ones I need you to know, and I'm sure it says it in your study sheet, but it's PMAT. That's how I remember it. This is how, I didn't used to remember it this way. It was actually Dr. Shearer that tells his students this. And I thought it was made sense to me. So um, like if you have a new puppy, you're going to have it pee on the mat, right? So I don't know. So pee mat. So, uh, so, and that's the order it'll go in. So the first one is going to be prophase. Prophase. I'll write it here because I know it's small up there. It's blurry in case you're not following along in your uh, computers or whatever. So prophase, we're just getting ready here. So originally your DNA, it doesn't exist in those fancy X's that we're used to seeing. They don't exist like that normally. They're normally just one line, one linear piece for one chromosome. Um, it doubles up during mitosis. It makes a copy. You're about to see why, but it makes a copy of itself. And that's what we see in the X's. It's the easiest to see the chromosomes when they're going through mitosis. So that's usually when they do imaging of the chromosomes because they're just contained and um, concentrated and all that. But yeah, so they're not normally like that in normal functioning cells. But now we've made our copy of our genetic information. Each of our chromosomes has its copy attached to it at the center called a, cent a centromere. And they're called sister chromatids when they're attached like that because they're exact copies of one another. Um, and then we have these weird fibers that we call spindle fibers that are stretching along these lines up here. And then these guys out here are called centrioles and they are going to help stretch the spindle fibers. That's all they do. I'm not going to ask you about the terms on those, but I would just be aware definitely of what the chromosomes and the nucleus is doing in each of these steps. Okay. So prophase, we're just getting everything ready. We doubled up, we're concentrating on our DNA, and we're getting our spindle fibers ready. So pro is before, so before we're getting ready to go. All right, the next one, the biggie one for me, and the most obvious one, is the metaphase. We're going to line up all of those chromosomes and uh, get ready to pull them apart. So they're gonna, they're gonna line up in the equator of that one cell. And the spindle fibers are the ones that are gonna get them into place and the centrioles are helping with that. But that's how what's gonna happen in metaphase. And then we have anaphase where we're getting some business done. We're not just talking the talk, now we're walking the walk. And here, both of these are images of anaphase. Similar thing, which just one's earlier on and one's later on, but we've pulled those sister chromatids apart. So there's exact matches that made up the X's, now we've separated them at their centromeres. And so now they're gonna be separate chromosomes, single chromosomes. Anyways, that's anaphase where we do that separating. And then where is it? Oh, I'm using the eraser, that's why. Telophase, oh, I didn't really circle it right, but yeah, telophase. that's where everything's going to start working to go back to cell, right? So we're going to make, rebuild the nucleus, um, start separating the cells from one another, the new cells that we've made. So we get two new nuclei and we start having separation of those cells that we've just made. And now they each have single chromosomes and they're going to start to be ready to be cells and function again. So that's why we have the doubling up in the prophase. So we can just double up and then pull it apart. And now we have new cells. Pretty cool. Alrighty, moving on. For, that's all you need to know about mitosis. So I would just like to review it. Prophase, getting ready, doubling up the DNA. A metaphase, your nucleus is gone. You, you're lining up your chromosomes. Anaphase, you're separating them. Telophase, you're starting to make new cells afterwards. That's your product. That's all I need you guys to know about it. Um, oh yeah, also, I do want to mention one thing. Meiosis. Now, if we're doing this and we're separate and we're making copies of all of our chromosomes, and you probably know that you got one chromosome from your mom and one chromosome from your dad. That's how sex cells come together, right? Um, you have two of each chromosome, one from mom and one from dad, genetically speaking, right? Um, so in order to have that happen, if I were to go through mitosis, like we just explained, um, and separate out the copies again, we can't use those as sex cells because that came up with somebody else's that was like that, you know, 46 and 46. Now we've got 
you know, what is that, 92? Too many. That's why too many. You only need <laughs> the two of each one, right? So how do we split it down to where you only have one of each chromosome? Like not one from mom and one from dad, but one of each kind of chromosome. Um, and that's what meiosis is for. So meiosis has another step in there that's going to separate out those, I don't say copies of like, if you have chromosome one, you have one from mom and one from dad, well, they're going to split so we have only one. How do they pick which one? It tends to be random. And you can also have crossover from mom and dad while you're making your uh, cells, your sex cells. That's why it's not super predictable what the kids are going to look like. Otherwise, all the girls would look like mom and boys <laughs> will look like dad. So, um, so yeah, there's some crossover that'll happen there too, to give it variety. That makes sense. So that way you have half, we call that haploid. You have half as many as an actual functioning cell would need, but that's how many you have in your gametes. So that's going to be your eggs and your sperm for us. So that's how, what meiosis is. Meiosis is for the sex cells. Okay. All righty, all right, all right. Endoplasmic reticulum. Um, it is for, yeah, it says microscopic series of tunnels used in transport and storage. Uh, cool. So what we really need to know about the ER is that we have production of proteins in the rough ER. And it's rough because it's studied with ribosomes. When you look at it with a microscope, an electron microscope, it looks like it's dotted with stuff all over. So they would call it rough. The smooth ER, there's no ribosomes there, but we're still making molecules. It's just not protein. It's non-protein molecule. So we're going to make, store, and sometimes modify non-protein molecules in the smooth. So we're always making, storing, and or modifying either protein in the rough or not protein in the smooth. This is where we're making our molecules. And usually they're going to be our basic um, ones. And if you need some serious modifications or you need to package them into like all, like you're making a toxin, you need to package them all into one vesicle. Well, guess what? That's what the Golgi apparatus is for. So we're gonna move on to that. But here's the picture of the rough ER. You can see the little ribosome. This is like, if it was on the little membranes and it's got a lot of folds, the all membrane. And those ribosomes on that membrane are just gonna be reading along mRNA, the messenger RNA that we made the copy from in the nucleus and spitting out protein into the inside of that endoplasmic reticulum. That's what ribosomes do all day long in our cells, in the eukaryotic cell. Where does this happen? in bacteria, because they have to do this too, right? It's just happening in the cytoplasm. Like, it's really boring, that's always the answer, but it is. All right, next is the Golgi apparatus. You guys have probably seen images of this before. Yeah, that, that endoplasmic reticulum where it's all like folds and folds and folds. We have some cells that are so dedicated to making just protein, and usually even one kind of a protein, that they look like they are just endoplasmic reticulum. And one of the best examples that I have of that would be the plasma cell. And plasma cell, in this case, I'm talking about the cells that produce antibody. They start out as B cells. Once they're activated and they start cranking out antibody, they're plasma cells. All they do is make that antibody. And that is it. And they just are constantly making it. So they have so much endoplasmic reticulum in there. It's like, that's all they are, pretty much. Cool. Golgi apparatus, this is where we're going to have protein modification. Like I was saying, you have some uh, different things that you need to stick on your proteins. Maybe it's sugars to make it a glycoprotein, or maybe it's a lipid to make it a lipoprotein. You know, we can do whatever we want, but a lot of that modification, the more um, complicated modifications are going to go on in the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus looks like a more bulbous ER, like it's just a more rounded shape, but it's pretty similar looking. And it typically always is going to come after the ER in the whole process. So you go from the nucleus to the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus, and then out of the cell if you need to go out of the cell. Um, so anytime you need to package something in a vesicle, that is going to be happening in the Golgi apparatus. This is where we're going to be making our lysosomes, which are our digesting um, organelles. They're just literally vesicles that contain digesting enzymes and chemicals and stuff like that, toxic chemicals. And why do we need that? Either to break down food that we eat as a cell or to break down enemies. So it's often what we think about when we're gonna be talking about it is gonna be in our phagocytes, our white blood cells. They, that's what they do. Yeah, I tell you about phagocytes coming and eating up the bad guys, right? But what happens after that? Well, they have them in a vesicle and they merge 
bad guy vesicle with lysosomes and break them down. And then we can either use what's made as a result or we can just like kick it out of the cell. Um, that, yeah. Cool, so that's the Golgi. So it mostly it's just gonna be adding polysaccharides and lipids to the proteins and then making vesicles. Uh, so here we have the ER, we have transitional vesicles between the ER and the Golgi because we're transitioning. And then we have the condensing vesicles. We've made our final product and now we're containing what we need to in our vesicles for storage or transport or whatever. Uh, most people don't understand about the Golgi apparatus. I had this virus that I was studying in graduate school that like budded into the Golgi apparatus. So rather than coating itself with membrane from the host cell, which is what a lot of viruses do, it coated itself with membrane from the Golgi apparatus and then let the Golgi like vesicles just secrete it out into its milieu, you know, surroundings or whatever, and then go infect more cells nearby. And that's how it worked. It was a hemorrhagic fever. And uh, when you think about stuff like that, where it's like kind of messing up the membrane in weird, unique ways, it's not surprising that it could cause hemorrhage, which is a lot of times going to be breakdown of the endothelium, um, usually due to membrane problems. Okay, so our assembly line, nucleus, rough ER, Golgi, out of the cell. That's basically it. So this is just showing you that so you guys can get a sense of what's happening. Um, you go to Smithsonian, you make a copy of the thing you want to make, you take it out into the rough ER. The rough ER ribosomes are going to make the protein from that copy. That protein is going to go into the Golgi, it's going to get modified, and it's going to get packaged and then excreted out of the cell. Basically it. Especially if you're trying to get stuff out of the cell, like making a signaling molecules and stuff like that. All right, so our vesicles. Some of the vesicles that the Golgi might make and have like hanging out in the cell ready to go at any given time. The lysosomes, which I just told you guys about, the digesting um, versions. And then we're gonna have the vacuoles. And the vacuoles are our storage um, structures. So store food or like water. Typically water, especially if you think about plants, plant cells are like primarily vacuole. They have large vacuoles containing a lot of water. And um, if they dry out too much, that's why they kind of wilt because sometimes the the vacuoles are pretty important for maintaining the structure of the cells as well. So, whatever. Moving on to the mitochondria. Again, mitochondria is going to be a site of energy production. So I'm talking about making ATP. We're going to talk about the details of that in chapter 10. I hate that I have to wait that long, but I do. Um, we're going to get to it though. So the structure, it really has two major structures going on within it. It looks like a bean. It has all these folds inside of it. Let's see if it has. No, not right away. It doesn't. Yeah, here we go. Um, it looks like a bean and it has these little folds inside of it. These are called cristae, this membrane. And then the inside of it is called the matrix. I feel like that part's pretty short. But those folds, um, they do have their own ribosomes, like I've mentioned previously, to make their own proteins for them to function. They're going to be bacterial type ribosomes. They have their own DNA, it's circular, um, and they are double membraned. This is kind of obvious here because we have a membrane in here and a membrane here. So it's suggestive of bacteria or some sort of bacterial precursor or something. Like that. That's what they think. So uh, what really happens, like we have all of these folds and why have to put the same space? We, we know this with the brain, right? It has those folds in there to fit as much as it can into the skull and give you as much basically surface area to work with as you can manage. Same with the um, my mitochondria. So basically what is going on is aerobic respiration, which like I said, I'm going to teach you that in chapter 10. I'm going to try to refrain from getting into it too much, but um, making ATP, you need oxygen. Yeah, you need oxygen. You're going to make carbon dioxide. All of that is going to be associated in the mitochondria to make this cell energy. You need ATP to do pretty much mostly anything in the cell. Okay, chloroplasts, very similar to the mitochondria, um, at least in the concept of how their shape works, but they have different kinds of things going on. I'm not going to ask you about their structures on the inside because we're not talking about plants and we're not really talking about algae, right? So I don't really need you to know about the chloroplasts, but, um, but just so you know, again, we have maximizing of sur surface area with these stacks here so that we can have as much... Um, sunlight exposure and make as much energy from the sunlight as we can to all those different layers. Um, we have inside and outside with these as well. Uh, the chlorophyll, 
what happens with this, just so you guys have a general idea of it, chlorophyll, we already know it's, um, you know, a color, a pigmented molecule. It's green. It's going to react with sunlight. The sunlight energizes it um, and kicks off energy in the form usually of electrons. We can use that energy to power the production of ATP. They make ATP that way. They can't get a lot of ATP from that. And the ATP that they get from this, from photosynthesis, is going to go straight into turning carbon dioxide, which is an inorganic carbon source, to be clear, turning carbon dioxide into a, like glucose or something like that, fixing it into an organic molecule. And then what do they do with glucose after they make it? Why are they making glucose? Because it's going to go through cellular respiration. And cellular respiration, which is how we make our ATP in our mitochondria, that um, makes about 38 ATP as opposed to the two that you get from photosynthesis. So for each cycle that we're talking about. Pretty impressive that they developed to be that way, um, taking inorganic carbon and turning it into an organic carbon source. Um, they need oxygen to do the mitochondria part though, but it's just they make so much of it more that it works out for us in the end, you know? So I don't know. Cool though. Uh, yeah, what were we gonna say? Ribosomes, we already talked about this. They're gonna make the protein for us. They consist of ribosomal RNA. They call the eukaryotic ribosome the ADS. That's just talking about how much it weighs whenever they spin it in a high speed centrifuge and it settles in this freaking gel and who cares? It's called Svedberg unit. It's not important, but what's important is that we have ADS, bacteria have 70S and our mitochondria have 70S and chloroplasts have 70S and archaea have ADS. Really interesting stuff when you start mixing it up like that. But neat. Um, you know what the rough ER is? That's what we're going to make proteins. The cool thing, well, we'll get into that when we get genetic. I don't want to start it now. All right, next we have the cytoskeleton. Um, this is going to be anchoring your organelles into place, so where they should be in the cell and keeping them there. So as I am gesturing a lot and moving around all the time, all of the organelles in my cells, in my body, are maintaining their location in the cells. So we're anchoring our organelles. It also allows us to move RNA and vesicles. I keep saying about how we're going to make a copy of um, the DNA into RNA, and we're going to take that into the endoplasmic reticulum. But how does it get there? Like, what does that mean? It goes into the endoplasmic reticulum. Does it just float there? No. Um, there are aspects of the cytoskeleton. They have their own proteins there. It's like a network of kind of like cable cars or something like that. And these proteins will just carry things around where they need to go. Um, they get signals from the area around them that tells them where to carry it. There's some really cool videos about this, by the way. Um, if you're interested, I don't want to put too much on you guys, but uh, this shows like proteins, basically like how they move and they look like they're walking. They take little steps like as proteins and they do this. This is actually how they work. Um, and the, every time they take a step, they need energy. It's the ATP that they need. So you can start to see how important the ATP would be for everything in your cells. But yeah. So it's pretty cool. Cytoskeleton is it's very important. Um, we have shape of the cell, anchoring organelles, and moving things around in the cell. So getting those vesicles from the rough, from the ER in general to the Golgi, and then from the Golgi out of the cell, those vesicles don't move on their own. They have to be moved by the cytoskeleton. We have three filaments involved in the cytoskeleton, the actin filaments, the intermediate filaments, and the microtubules from smallest to largest. All right, fungi, let's get into these groups now. We have macroscopic fungi. That's going to be the ones you can see. I don't know what to tell you about it, but that's mushrooms and stuff like that. Uh, and then the microscopic ones. These are the ones that are going to concern us more. So the molds and the yeasts. Yeasts, they're oval and they reproduce by asexual means, and they're going to bud off of one each other, one another. They still use mitosis to do this, so um, it doesn't work the same as like binary fission with bacteria. Um, so it's like uneven cells. So those cells have to like regrow after they go through that telophase portion, but that's how they're going to reproduce. So it's a lot like bacteria um, and they're single cells and whatever. Hyphae, these are just structures that are long and thread-like. When you think of mold and it's like got those long hairy appendages going on, each of those long furry pieces, those tiny little long furry pieces, that's hyphae that we're talking about. Yeast can form similar structures called pseudohyphae. Um, and some fungi can go between the structures, the different forms. If you have in your hyphae, your long little uh, segments in your mold, 
uh, each cell is separated as a single cell. Those are called, the separation is called septa. Now we would just call it like individual cell, like whatever, why do they need a name? Because a lot of times, like let's see here, for these non-septate hyphae, they just become like one and they don't have separations between the cells anymore. That's how that works with fungi. Um, here's a picture of how the yeasts bud. Like I said, they're gonna bud using mitosis. And then so our initial cells need to kind of grow up and become mature again before they can bud. And it's not always like equal or even. All right, fungal nutrition. We have heterotrophic. Um, this is gonna mean that they can have a lot of different sources of food. Saprobes, they need their food from dead things. And then parasites, they rely on a host and they're causing harm to that host. That's what a parasite is. Uh, we can see here this moldy raspberries. We could say that that is actually a saprobe situation because those raspberries really are like dead and rotting at this point. So they're just trying to eat up the dead and rotting material that's going on there. Um, and then we have the feet that's like athlete's foot. So that's clearly going to be parasitic. Okay. Uh, we can get pretty specific with the structures of the fungi, the whole structure. So we talked about the little furry pieces. Well, the whole thing, when you look at it, is called the mycelium. So the whole puffy thing that's growing or the green spot on your bread, whatever, that's the mycelium. We're gonna talk about the septa, cross, dividing the hyphae into segments, into individual cells. Um, and spores are fungal reproductive bodies. So we're gonna talk about spores here. These are for reproduction purposes, not like bacterial endospores, okay? All right, all right. This is just showing you rhizopus, which is like grows on bread. Um, and then the reproductive structures up here, which we're going to talk more about, which I hate. I, I'm really not interested in mold, so I'm just kind of going through this because I have to. All right, uh, so fungi, they have different ways they can grow, either just keeping growing out from where they're at. They can fragment, break off a piece of mold and put it onto a new piece of bread, and it'll grow a new mold, you know, mycelium. And then um, the primary reproductive mode that they typically will want to do is spore formation. So that is like if they are growing on one piece of bread over here and there's another piece of bread over there, their spores could blow in the wind and grow on the bread over here. So that's their normal way of like spreading how they're going to um, you know, reproduce. All right, like I said, I would want to make clear again, these are um, not the endospores. They're not like resistant or anything like that. It's just for reproductive purposes. I don't know why they name things so similar, but that's just what they do. So most of the time, we're going to be going through asexual reproduction for fungi. We have the sporangiospores and the conidiospores. The sporangiospores, just FYI, they're going to come from the sporangium. It's just what you need to know about this. It's covered. It's really all you need to know. Spores are inside. They're called sporangiospores that are inside. Um, and they have this covering over them. The whole structure is called the sporangium. But I'm really not going to get too detailed on that. I just want you guys to be aware that when we're talking about sporangio, covered ones. Okay. Conidio, clearly not covered. They're just always like out there, you know, spitting off spores all the time. There's no cover on them. Um, yeah, not covered. Exposed. I should have said exposed. <sighs> okay. And they can have sexual spores. That's just going to, you know, um, allow for differences in genetic material, better survival in certain conditions and everything like we might have in normal sexual conditions, but they don't do that the most. They mostly do the asexual reproduction. And we can identify these species based on their asexual structures. So I'm talking about these weird covered bulbs and uncovered bulbs. They can all have different kinds of shapes depending on the species as well and colors and everything. So all that stuff can be used to identify them. So that's the most important microscopic analysis other than the macroscopic I'm just saying it is green mold <laughs> you know that sort of stuff and whether it has hyphae or not so here we have the sporangium containing these sporangia spores that's the one on the left this whole structure here is called the sporangium and this is the that structure is called the conidio four and the spores themselves are conidiospore or sporangiospore. Anyways, you can see it quite clearly in the images. That's my point. Covered or uncovered. And like, really, I'm only going to ask you about that. 
Um, medical conditions associated. We have pathogenic fungi. A lot of the time we are talking about um, opportunistic infections with these guys. So if you get a sinus infection and you have swelling in your sinuses, you can develop polyps that won't go away in your sinuses and that can trap mold spores just from the environment. Um, most of the mold in the environment is going to be aspergillus. It's all over the place. It's just everywhere. But it can get caught up in your sinuses when you're having this inflammatory reaction and can't clear it out properly and grow into a ball, a mold ball, um, fungal ball is what they would call it. But anyways, it can get trapped in there. And then um, you might need to have surgery to have it all removed and whatever. I know because I went through this, that's how I'm talking about it. Um, I'm apparently, because I'm allergic to mold, like was more susceptible to this. Now, every time that I get a sinus infection, I have to like be really sure that I am taking care of it to get it all cleared out so that I don't get mold again. Cause it was just aspergillus. It was just in the environment. Um, but anyways, so we have stuff like that. It was just wrong place, wrong time, wrong situation, right? Just made the right um, sort of conditions for it to grow there, but it doesn't normally do that. It's normally just environmental. So there's that sort of stuff. There's also stuff where like you have a lowered immune system. You had a transplant and you're on, you know, immune system suppressing drugs. You're more susceptible to all infections, including the fungal ones. Same with HIV. That HIV, the virus is doing that to you, right? Um, and then you might just have poor you know, nutrition or you might be pregnant. All of these things can make you more susceptible to getting infected by things that normally wouldn't cause a problem. Those are opportunistic infections. Um, they're typically not going to be doing that in other situations. So we have hospital-associated fungal pathogens. We have community acquired, so that just means getting passed around in the community. Um, when we think about like fungal meningitis and stuff like that, sometimes even healthy people can get that. Mostly it's going to be HIV patients, but it can be in healthy people too. All right, anyway. Now we know allergies and neurological conditions from toxins. We know you can get benefits from fungi. We're almost like you're talking about, okay, the role in the environment, sure, but like bread and yeast, um, uh, working for beer and all of that sort of stuff. I'm right, moving on to the protists, the protista kingdom. The protista kingdom is kind of like anything that doesn't have any true tissue. So that's gonna be the algae and the protozoa. Okay, the algae, they are photosynthetic protists. We've already talked about this. They make most of the oxygen in our environment. They also include seaweed and kelp. And they also are a big part of plankton and the plankton um, the algae and the plankton are about 70% of their oxygen that we're making. That's where it comes from. All right. All right, moving on to the protozoa. Because, like, obviously, algae isn't going to be causing disease. So, moving on. Biology of protozoa. We have about 65,000 species. They're going to be single. So, these are always unicellular organisms. Um, most of them are harmless, but some of them cause infections. They can have organelles that look like actual organs like mouth parts, reproductive tracts, legs, and stuff like that, but they're actually still just a single cell organism. So it's pretty advanced cell that we're talking about here. And their habitat and range, again, heterotrophic, like a lot of the eukaryotes. Uh, they can be free living, scavenging as like saprobes. Um, they can graze on living cells, bacteria and algae. And then we have the parasitic species. They speak for themselves. All right. Now, this is bringing us to those pseudopods, like you were talking about with amoebas. Amoebas that will use the little pseudopods to move themselves along. That's called amoeboid motion. Amoebas are protozoa, right? Um, so they can use that for feeding. We already talked about flagella. We know what it does. It's going to use whip-like motion. And then we've got cilia all over the cell surface that can help the cell move around, like little hairs. Um, so they can move around by those three means. So here are some examples of like the four groups of the protozoa that we can have. Now, I just said there's three ways that they can move around. Flagellum, pseudopod, cilia. The fourth guy down here, they don't move, they don't have locomotion. This is the non-moving ones. But it's important because these are where the most parasites exist. Most of them fall into that category. All right. Uh, just like bacteria sometimes had, when we talked about endospores, you guys remember vegetative cells was the normal. And the endospore was whenever it's producing its dormant stage to protect itself. The protozoa can, can do the same thing. Just like bacteria, not all of them do. Some of them do. Um, it's more common in protozoa, actually. But you have two forms, trophozoite. And just FYI, troph 
does mean eat. Um, or you can think of it like, like being like trough, like if the pig was eating from a trough. Do you eat when you are dormant? No. So you won't be eating when you're dormant. When you're dormant, you're literally doing nothing. You're just waiting. So the trophozoite, you can think of that's the eating stage. Now you can remember that that's the modal stage. That's the normal, that's the same thing as the vegetative cells. The cyst is our dormant stage. This is the equivalent to the endospore. This is usually the most important factor in spreading of disease in protozoan infections. All right, our life cycles, reproduction, I really don't care about it, but they can go through sexual or asexual, okay? Like that's all I need. Um, they can exchange genetic information without having te technical true sexual um, reproduction as well. So, all right. Oh uh, yeah, so they're breaking down basically on these slides things that also I don't care about. Things like uh, those that use flagella are more likely to be sexual reproduction. Those that are amoeboid, and I don't need you to know any of this. I just want you to know flagella, amoeboid, cilia, or none. Like that's the mo locomotion I'll need you to know from that. And that most of the parasites, like all of the none moving ones are parasites, by the way. Okay, so we can divide them up based on their appearance. Um, yeah, I hate that it goes over this stuff. I feel like this stuff is obvious. How would you tell the difference between protozoa by looking them under a microscope or doing, you know, DNA tests or whatever, like the obvious stuff? Um, presence of cysts, what the cyst looks like. All this. Is it in blood or is it just in stool? So what do I want to say? Yeah, okay. All right, let's talk, talk about the pathogens for a moment. The ones that are amoebas. Amoeboid protozoa. There's one called Entamoeba histolytica. Go figure, diarrhea. We're going to talk a lot about diarrhea in this class, so I hope you're ready for that. Um, so diarrhea. Then we have Neglaria phalori and Acanthamoeba. These guys are the brain-eating amoebas. You get these into your sinus cavity. They can transport into your brain. It's usually how they get there. Um, it is 97% fatality. Once you start having symptoms, there's not much they can do because it happens pretty quickly. So, um, but very uncommon, really rare. It's really not very common. However, having said that, you don't want it, don't use uh, tap water in your neti pots or at least boil it. If you're gonna use a neti pot, boil your water first or use distilled water from like a bottle, something like that. Uh, yeah, cause that's me telling you that it's in your tap water, <laughs> FYI. Um, ciliated protozoa. The ones that get around with the little appendages swimming around. This is Ballantidium coli. Coli, yes, just like with E. coli, colon. So in the gut, this is going to be diarrhea. Giardia lamblia. This causes giardiasis. It's a uh, diarrhea. <laughs> so this is going to be um, the greasy malodorous stools that can last for like months. So it's pretty rough. Next, we have Trichomonas vaginalis. Trichomonas vaginalis causes trichomoniasis. It is a very common sexually transmitted disease. If you ever end up working at Southwest Integris, you and you work in their ER, you're going to see some hookers that have this. Like you will. Like we had a lot of them in the lab. We would get samples all the time for this. I mean, all the time. Um, so get ready for that. Uh, I don't know if hookers have this at other hospitals. I just know because I worked there. <laughs> they definitely did. So yeah. Um, Leishmaniasis. So trypanosoma. Actually, before I skipped it, but trypanosomiasis, we have sleeping sickness and we have Chagas disease. If you've ever tried to donate blood, you may have heard of Chagas disease. It's a disease that is transmitted by something called the kissing bug. It's a pretty large bug. It's about this size and it has this very unique pattern on it. It's um, very obvious to recognize. Honestly, they're big and they have that, like, I don't know how to describe it, but we'll see it later on when we talk about the disease. Um, and they have this proboscis and it's like a flat mouth that shoots out of their head and they bite you. And then they poop in their right. And then that's how you get this protozoan. That's how it's transmitted. Um, they like to live in houses because it's nice and cozy. They, it's not too warm. It's not too cold and all that. Um, and they usually make their nests in houses somewhere if they are there. And uh, we do have this in Oklahoma. It, it is present here. We're not having a ton of the animals, the animals, the bugs testing positive for this. But we have had people coming with positive tests at um, donating at OBI that 
in whatever, in Arkansas and Oklahoma and wherever else. So just be aware that that is something that can happen. If you see those bugs, and like I said, they're pretty identifiable, feel free to look them up online. They're called kissing bugs or triatamine bugs. Um, just be aware of them. They're mostly going to prey on children. It's children, I don't know why, which they do. Next, we have uh, leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis, uh, yeah, it's a skin problem that you're going to get from a, a biting sand fly, typically. Um, you can get it in the Middle East, or you can get it in like Central South America. It's two different kinds of it. Whoops. And then we have the non-motile protozoa. This is going to be Plasmodium species. Any of the Plasmodiums, in particular Plasmodium falciparum, the most common. Malaria. We have Toxoplasma gondii. Uh, toxoplasma, um, toxoplasmosis causes a flu-like illness in an average, normal, relatively healthy person. If you are pregnant and you get this, then it is very common to have things like um, abnormalities in the fetus, very common to have uh, end up having stillbirth, uh, miscarriage, and all sorts of things like this. It's not common to have a baby like be normal after having this infection. So when you or anybody you know is pregnant, do not let them handle the cat litter. Most cats have it. It's not uncommon. And almost everybody in the United States will have had it at some point in their life and not even know. It's one of those kinds of things. You know, get a little bit of flu-like illness. Who would know, right? Um, so most people have been exposed to it. But interesting fact about it, um, it controls, seems to control the minds of like mice. So they are risk takers. And, um, you know, they're going to go out in front of mice, uh, in front of the cats and get eaten by the cats, which was their main reservoir of this protozoan. And so they're more likely to be risk takers. Um, and stuff like that. Well, they think that it might affect people the same way. I'm just saying. How would you know? So, cryptosporidium. This causes cryptosporidiosis, diarrhea. <laughs> it survives chlorine really well. Um, so, usually we see this in swimming pools, like public swimming pools, uh, associated with it, anyways. Hopefully, not in it. Hopefully, you're not having it in it. But cyclospora, kayak. Uh, I don't know, man. Some of these I'm not going to be able to say. I try every time. Cayetanensis. There it is. Cayetanensis. Now we're good for about 10 minutes. Uh, cyclosporiasis. I don't know much about it. It's diarrhea. I do know that. So like I said, there's going to be a lot of diarrhea. Moving on to the helminths. The helminths are the worms. And if you want to try to get through these. Um, flatworms and roundworms. Flatworms. I don't know why it's not in the slide. Flatworms are called... And you do have to know this one, platy helminthes. All the flatworms are platy helminthes. If you are tapeworm, you are cestode. That's their word, cestoda. And then trematoda is the flukes. I'm going to show you a picture of a fluke in a moment. Uh, and then we have roundworms. Roundworms are called nematodes. They're pretty self-explanatory. They look round. All right, so that's all of our groups. Our morphology, you have actual organs. Mouths is multicellular organisms here. So they have actual true reproductive tracts, um, digestive systems, um, you know, muscular systems, everything. Uh, so they usually have complex life, life cycles, I'm just saying. They often need to have an intermediate host of some kind at some point in almost all of their life cycles that they don't just infect one type of organism. So I was talking about with one of my students, I just recently adopted two dogs, um, two little dogs, little chihuahua mixes, and they have heartworms. And uh, heartworms, like their larvae, will swim around in the bloodstream. Of, that's how they test for it, typically. They test for it from the blood. And uh, if you take the blood from those dogs that have heartworms, and we're, if my dog other dog weren't treated, but she has seen a treatment, but she didn't, and you put it into her, she wouldn't get heartworms from that. Why? Because the larvae have to go through mosquitoes first. <laughs> it's just crap like this with the helmets. Like, why? I don't know why, but they that's their life cycles, and they're pretty complicated. So you might have to have some sort of period where you spend like this life cycle in a mosquito before you can get transmitted back into the dog or whatever. So. All right, anyways, it's pretty complicated. They can be hermaphroditic, they can have sexual reproduction, it, whatever. Most of the flukes are gonna be hermaph hermaphroditic. 
And the final host, um, the definitive host, is the one where they're having the actual sexual reproduction happening. The adults are reproducing. Um, how do you get these? Uh, from your food, from your soil, from your water, from infected animals. They can get in usually through oral intake or penetration of unbroken skin. When I say penetration of unbroken skin, I mean like literally intact skin, and it will go in through your intact soles of your feet, climb through that skin. I'm not kidding. That's what hookworms and threadworms do. They crawl in through your actual skin. If you go swimming in water contaminated with blood flukes, schist schistosomiasis is what the disease is called, schistosomes in the water, um, usually excreted from urine from something nearby, uh, or from snails, because they have a snail life cycle as well. Uh, they'll just get in through your skin and it causes what they call swimmer's itch. And that's just from the itchiness from them getting in through your skin. You'd never see it happening. It's just, you'd be itchy. And now you have schistosomes. Um, they're flukes. So anyways, it's this is the stuff of nightmares, you guys. <laughs> like This is the stuff of nightmares. Um, so how we're going to identify them. I feel like this one is obvious, right? They're going to look different. They're going to have different kinds of eggs. They're going to have different kinds of hosts and all this stuff. So that one's easy. How do you identify uh, heartworms? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You look for the eggs, for the larvae in the blood. It's pretty straightforward. Um, there are 50 species of worms that parasitize humans. Uh, we do have some in the United States that parasitize humans. I do want to be clear. We have these pinworms, pinworms that are in little kids that get I think I've told you guys about this, the itchy butthole thing where you put the tape and then, yeah. So anyways, that's in the United States, not uncommon actually. It's more common to have these in obviously underdeveloped countries and in areas where they have poor uh, sewage control where they're actually washing and drinking from the water that they are dumping their sewage into. If they don't have the means to clean that stuff. All right, so that's the helmets. What characteristic of the mitochondria provide evidence to support the endosymbiotic theory? We talked about this is going to be uh, the circular DNA, single circular DNA. They divide on their own. They have their own ribosomes. They have the two layers of the membranes. 